until Gear Solid was great for the first half, then it turned into a frustrating and disappointing mess. But everything before the backtracking began was good enough to make me want to check out the sequel, Sons of Liberty. The fact that I also bought the HD collection before I even started one also helps. So let's take a look at it. I wasn't the biggest fan of the first game, many people were, and thus were incredibly hyped at the thought of a sequel on, what was at the time, next-gen hardware. So exciting, in fact, that gamers bought another game called Zone of the Enders so they could play the demo of this game. After that, comparisons to the anticipation of The Phantom Menace aren't unwarranted. But as that film failed to do, did Metal Gear Solid 2 meet fan expectations? Let's meet rather flipped on its head. The game begins with Solid Snake infiltrating a ship carrying a new Metal Gear. He and Otacon plan to take pictures of said Metal Gear and release them to the public, but the Tanga soon gets taken over by Russian terrorists, making Snake's job harder than anticipated. Making things even harder is also a lot taking over from the terrorists and sinking the ship with Snake inside. Wait, what? After that, the game cuts to two years later where some more terrorists have taken over a military base called the Big Shell, and, in similar fashion to the first game, have the president held hostage. But good old Snake, supposedly dead, shows everyone wrong by going into the Big Shell to save the day, with a badass reveal to bo- WHAT?! You're not Snake. This is Raiden, a rookie at the selfing scene beside some VR training, and the character who you spend the rest of the game playing as, despite not being mentioned at all prior to release. The Hideo Kojima managed that is honestly pretty impressive, but many fans who wanted to play as Snake weren't too pleased to be controlling this guy instead. But 16 years on, and having known about this change before I popped the disc in, I can say I didn't mind too much and even enjoyed Raiden's company. He's a likeable presence, and if you stick around to hear some of Bruce's dialogue after you save, you get a sense of his life outside of the mission, which is something you didn't really get in the first game, and it makes him an interesting character. Actually, the rest of the supporting cast are really interesting as well. There's some familiar faces from the first game who are still likeable, and the new ones are well fleshed out. The villains are enjoyably over the top, and... This game is weird. The first game was kind of quirky, but from the moment I heard this line But I, I live on through this arm! I knew that I was in for a bizarre ride, but it's all the more enjoyable because of it. Especially towards the end when the rug is pulled out from under you and the game pulls an absolute zinger of a twist presented in such an insane way, it's hard not to enjoy it. But it's also incredibly thought-provoking, especially in this day and age. And the game still has its share of more serious, dramatic moments, which the story does a really good job of balancing between the more insane stuff that still has a point. And it makes for a very entertaining story, thanks to its likeable characters, the twists and turns that, especially towards the end, have me gasping out loud, one of which even fixed an issue I was having with the plot prior to the reveal. I could write essays and essays on the ending of the game, but for the sake of spoilers and time, I'll simply say that I loved seeing Snake's second, and Raiden's first, adventure unfold. And there's lots of story to be unfolded, thanks to cutscenes that get even longer than in the first game. At times, the length can get a bit grating, and I think it would be better if you could listen to some of the codec calls on the fly, but it's not how long they are that bothers me, it's the frequency. At the beginning of the big shell section, you take a few steps, and there's a cutscene. Walk a bit more, another cutscene. Carrying on, we f- Oh, for God's sake! Can I please play your game, Kojima? This goes on for a little while, and it really got on my nerves. However, it doesn't take long for the game to find its rhythm, and it's not too big an issue. Some cutscenes can drag, particularly when it looks like a little end, but it continues anyway. Yet overall, it's not too much of a deal breaker. When the cutscenes finally do end, are they greeted by fun stealth gameplay? Uh, kind of. This game is filled with narrow hallways with little to no means of staying hidden, meaning that I got caught by enemy guards fairly regularly. 
but gunplay has been drastically improved with the inclusion of a first person view, making your enemies much easier and fun to shoot. It also makes for some really enjoyable bosses that almost never got too frustrating for me, and there were some that I had an absolute blast taking down. But back to the stealth, I'm not saying it's not there at all, it's just that when the game begins, you feel like you've been thrown in the deep end. As I said, the hallways are much narrower, limiting your camouflage, but a new item at your disposal is a tranquilizer, so you can shoot your enemies while staying undetected. That's pretty much the easiest solution to taking enemies out, but it kind of works. And once you arrive at the big shell, the rooms become a bit more open, making stealth much more doable than in the tanker section. But Snake Slash Raiden's abilities are much more flexible this time around, meaning that you have a few options when it comes to either sneaking around or going full on with confrontations. So stealth isn't exactly a necessity, but rather an option. The trank was reliable enough for me to get through the area, and I had fun using it. Some will play stealthier, others might just initiate shootouts, but it means that you can tailor the experience to your own preference, and that's certainly not a bad thing at all. This campaign is also much more varied. There's many great sections throughout that makes things much more interesting, and that includes parts where stealth is outright required, bombs to defuse, a sequence where you're dressed in enemy uniform, a sniping section to clear the path for a character, and quite a few more. I really enjoyed pretty much all these sections, and it adds plenty of variety to the campaign, which, on reflection, the first game lacked a little bit. If you watch my review of the first, you'll know that the game was great until the backtracking began, and everything went downhill from there. I really enjoyed my time in the tanker, though it could be vague as to where you went next, but I have to admit, when I arrived at the big shell, with the frequency of the cutscenes and the absurdness of some of the things that were happening, it looked like this game was about to begin its downward spiral. And this game has you backtracking through areas a lot. Oh no, this game also gets worse as it continues along. Doesn't it? In regards to the cutscenes, you get a massive chunk that's all gameplay, and it picks up and there's soon a good balance between the story and the gameplay. But the big one is the backtracking. The Big Shell is a series of rooms connected by bridges. They're quick to get around and you gradually get new parts of the facility to explore. It's interesting how I pointed out how Skyward Sword had good backtracking to point out my frustration with the first game, whilst here I'd be making a comparison. Also, the connected rooms really give off a sense you're infiltrating a terrorist base, and the Ico-esque atmosphere of being trapped on a kind of island really adds to that. And as the game continues on, new areas open up and become the main focus, and it's really cool to explore them. So one of my biggest issues with the first game is one of its sequel's biggest strengths. I wasn't too sure what I was going to think of this game. Most people love the first one. Would it repeat its mistakes and turn me off from this series that started with so much promise? Well, I'm happy to say it didn't. Metal Gear Solid 2 retains what made the original's first half great and has an entire game like it, all whilst adding to and improving the gameplay, as well as featuring a gripping story with characters who are lots of fun to interact with and a poignant conclusion. I'm already looking forward to a second playthrough. Now that I know the ropes, I feel like there's a lot to experiment with in the tanker section. It's not a flawless game by any stretch of the imagination, but the stuff that's good is really, really, really good. And for that reason, I'll give it 91%. I'm thrilled to say that when I pop in the third game, I won't be hoping it captures the greatness of its predecessor's first half, I'll be hoping it captures the greatness of its predecessor, full. Stop.